Well, hi, everybody, and greetings from northern Michigan. This is Bob the Science Guy. Well, you know, I hear a lot of flat earthers say science is just math. You know, math is actually kind of cool. Let's do some fun stuff with it. Well, I tried to think about how to do this so that we could do some really cool stuff with math, and I decided the best bet would be to deal with Kepler's laws of planetary motion. So basically what I'm going to do is get my little flat earth model out here and a couple of pins, and I'm going to draw an ellipse because Kepler's first law of motion says that planets orbit their suns in an ellipse, and the sun is at the focus of one of the centers of that ellipse. So let's go ahead and draw one up and see what we can do. So here we have our ellipse. Uh, we have our two focuses or foci of the ellipse and the sun's at one of them. And then there's that uh, planet sitting out there and it's revolving around the sun in a counterclockwise fashion. And that's pretty much it for the first law of planetary motion. It's an ellipse, sun's at a foci of the ellipse. Well, let's think about this a little bit for a second. Now that planet uh, in its orbit is moving away from the sun right now. So you can think that the sun's gravitational pull is kind of pulling it backwards, the opposite direction of its orbit. So I think that you can imagine that it's starting to slow down a little bit in its path around its sun. And when it gets out to about that nine o'clock position, it will be going the slowest it will ever go in its orbit. Then as it comes around and starts coming around the bottom of the orbit there, the gravitational pull of the sun is going to start accelerating it a little bit as it goes along the orbit. And by the time it gets over to about the 3 o'clock position, it's going to be going the fastest through the orbit that it can go. And it'll make that turn and start slowing down a little bit until it gets back out to 9 o'clock. Now when we get to Kepler's second law of planetary motion, it starts getting a little interesting. If you look at the dots along this orbit, those all represent the same period of time as it goes through the orbit. As you see when it's out on the 3 o'clock position where it says planet there, the orbit is kind of slowing down a little bit. So the planet doesn't move very far along the orbital path. And then as it keeps going around in a counterclockwise manner, when it starts getting a little closer to the sun, it's speeding up and it sweeps out a longer period in the orbital path. And this is where Kepler's second law comes into play. Those shaded areas, uh, both at the two o'clock position and down there about eight o'clock, those are equal areas. Now, for example, the orbit of the moon around the earth follows these same mechanics. So if we know that it takes, say, three and a half days to get to the moon, we can accurately predict where the moon will be three and a half days after the launch and find it. We can also use these mechanics in the case of the moon, for example, to predict solar and lunar eclipses, because we can very precisely define where uh, an object will be in its orbit at any one time. And we do that simply by using Kepler's second law to understand very exactly what an orbit is. Now, when we get to Kepler's third law, we start getting into a little bit of math, but we can really do some awesome stuff with it. Now you can see in the middle of that page there that the orbital time squared is proportionate to the cube of the radius of the orbit. But I'm betting that a proportion is not good enough for you and you're going to lose a lot of sleep. So let's sit down and do all the math and figure out exactly how these two terms are related to each other. So let's head over to the dining room table and get a piece of paper out and grab my handy dandy fountain pen and we're going to do some math. Now, as you recall, I said the orbital time squared is proportionate to the radius cubed. That means in order to get the orbital time square, we have to add something or do something to the radius cube to get an exact amount. Chances are there's some sort of a formula or a constant in there. Let's see if we can figure out what that is. Now, a few days ago, I did a presentation on why objects don't fly off the equator despite the fact the Earth is moving at 1,000 miles an hour linear speed. 
And what we concluded was that gravity was holding objects on the surface until the spin was fast enough that the centrifugal force equaled or exceeded gravity. So let's go ahead and write out Newton's formula for gravity, which is the gravitational constant times the mass 1 times mass 2 divided by radius squared. And we'll set that equal to the centrifugal force, which is mass times the velocity squared over radius. So we'll go ahead and put that on a fresh sheet of paper. And now let's see if we can start getting some values together for this and see if we can figure out this orbital velocity question. In case you need some definitions, here they are. So our first step will be to simplify this equation a little bit. For example, the radius will knock out one of the radius squares. The mass of the planet will cancel itself out. And we'll just rearrange that a little bit. And now we're left with this. The gravitational constant times the mass of the sun over the radius of the orbit equals the orbital velocity squared. Now it might be helpful here to change our velocity squared to the tangential velocity on the orbit. That's the actual speed it's going around the orbit. We can easily uh, substitute that in by plugging in the tangential velocity equation, which is 2 pi r over t, time. Substituting that for v, we just square it, and we get v squared equals gravitational constant times the mass of the sun divided by the radius. Now we just make the square and we can start having some fun with this equation and it'll tell us some absolutely amazing things. The first thing that we're going to do is we're going to derive the orbital period of a planet. And here is our equation right here. So we have t squared, we have that constant, and then we have radius squared. That means it's no longer proportional. We can tell exactly what the orbital period of a planet will be. Now we're going to start having some fun with this equation and see what else it'll tell us. As you recall, when we discussed gravity in the Cavendish uh, experiment, we were able to actually weigh the Earth using the Cavendish experiment. Well, Kepler's third law here allows us to weigh the Sun. I don't know about you, but I think being able to weigh the sun is pretty freaking cool. Well, let's see what else we can do. Say we have a planet up in the sky, a planet like, say, Venus. Now, we know how long it takes Venus to make one complete orbit around the sun. Using Kepler's third law, we can actually calculate how far Venus is from the sun. In fact, we can use this same formula to calculate the distance to the sun for all the planets, simply based on knowing how long it takes them to make one complete orbit. Now, the math for this isn't extraordinarily complex. It's something that uh, any um, late middle school or high school student could do. And with this one equation, we can figure out our place in the solar system and the place of every other planet. Another interesting application is if we see an asteroid in space and watch it for a period of time, we can relatively quickly work out its orbit and decide whether it's going to hit the Earth or not. It's a relatively simple equation, but it gives us very powerful information. And that's one of the beauties of mathematics. We can model our natural world based on mathematics, and our answers that we get are real. So simply because something contains a mathematical model does not necessarily mean it's a bad thing. It doesn't mean that it's inaccurate. It actually allows us to understand our natural world better. Well, folks, a lot of information here, but I kept it short and sweet. Thank you very much for your attention. Oh